Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Run It Back. My name is Remco Rinkema, and I am joined by the one, the only, Dan Coleman, winner of the 2014 Big One for One Drop, and that is what we are watching today on the show. Dan, first and foremost, how have you been doing, man? What, what have you been up to? Yeah, I've been doing well. Uh, just enjoying life. Right now I'm in central Massachusetts. Uh, yeah, not playing any poker for the past couple of years. Uh, yeah, just, just enjoying life. I love it. Enjoying life. That is that is what I like to hear. Whenever someone is enjoying life, what else can you say? That's like the, the right thing to do. Um, that, that's the point, right? Yeah, that's the point. And, and let me start with this question right away. Very, very important. When is the last time you have seen this and how many times have you seen this footage? Wow. The last time I saw this was probably when it aired. Uh, yeah. And then apart from that, maybe seen a handful of clips on YouTube, like probably five years ago even a couple of years ago the past two years every now and then i think like ooh, how about that hand during one drop like i like to watch that over uh but yeah i couldn't find it so definitely need to get a poker go subscription and <laughs> watch the whole thing exactly for the people who are wondering you know where is all this footage well poker go is releasing all the classic wsop footage we've been doing it all summer since quarantine started 2003 is what we started with back in June. We are now up to 2008. We got 2009 and 10 coming in the next two weeks. And then in August, we'll be releasing the big one for OneDrop, both 2012 and 2014. So whatever you're looking for, it'll eventually be on Poker Go. If you can't find it, it'll send me a message at Remco Rinkum on Twitter. I'll help you get there. But yeah, tons and tons of action on Poker Go. Definitely worth the subscription. And seven seasons of high stakes poker. So I mean, what else can you really wish for during the quarantine? Um, high stakes poker, those were great. Those, I mean, those are epic as well. I mean, we've, we've done some running back shows with Negranu and uh, Phil Helmuth and there's just been so much epic stuff to cover um, but today we are covering a very special event for you the 2014 big one for one drop without seeing the footage you know as I'll as I'll start rolling it pretty soon um, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think back of that moment is it the win is it you know something else like what do you think back of to be honest I don't really think too much about the win I don't think too much about one drop it um like the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah, I, not nothing really, to be honest. All right. Yeah. So we might create some fresh memories off seeing yeah. the footage here uh, right now. Uh, for the people in the chat, thanks so much for joining us both on YouTube and Facebook. If you guys have any questions for Dan, please let me know. I'll pick the best ones. I'll fit them into the conversation. We got a lot of footage to cover here, so we'll dive deep into some strategy. And Dan, we got to set the tone here a little bit. Let's run this intro and get this hype going with this intro because I always feel as though they do such a great job with you know getting the, getting, getting the scene just right. So uh, let's listen in here. Four moments along. The way, but the most memorable will come tonight, the crowning of our champion. In 2012, Antonio Estandiari won $18 million, but his 10th place finish here in 2014 means someone else will claim a huge first place prize. If we make the final eight, the only downside is I've got to wear something really ugly that I promised the rugby team that I would wear if I made the final table. Few sporting events compared to the big one, both in prestige and in payday. As the players arrive, it remains a wide open race for first. Brown University grad Scott Siever is six of nine. His success at super high roller events will help him tonight. That's kid poker Daniel Negranu, fourth in chips, but no one is running hotter than Negranu. The other Daniel at this final table is Daniel Coleman. Young and talented, but the kid doesn't like the media. More on that later. We are just moments from cards in the air. I was just 23 then. 23, just a youngster. I mean, you're still looking quite young, so you know, haven't you haven't lost your touch yet? Um, I just turned 30 last weekend. 30, my God, retirement, yeah. huh? Retirement. How does oh. it feel? Um, yeah. All right, so okay, we are we are here. Big one for one drop, million dollar buy-in. Let's start with the obvious question: How in the world, at 23 years old, did you end up playing this million dollar buy-in event? What led up to you deciding this this is my chance? Yeah, I mean, in 2013, I had such a good year online. By the end of the year, I was getting fed up with fed up with the online grind. And I know I want to switch to playing live tournaments in 2014. And actually, at the start of that year, uh, I was just dead set on playing. Like, I even started raising money in January for it. I think I sold, like, over 80% of my action. Uh, yeah, and it was – obviously, it's real hard to raise 800K in action. Like, especially, I, don't have, I didn't have that big of a – live tournament resume uh but yeah something that i was aiming for for a while so then all of a sudden you walk in there you said you sit down in a million dollar tournament um 
I, I know you're you know very level-headed guy, but was there, was there anything special to you about the fact that this was indeed a million-dollar tournament? There were, there were only 42 players in the entire world who could find who could find a bag of money to play in this tournament. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm really not that level-headed. I'm a oh, bit emotional. Are you? Really? Yeah, but in uh, for whatever reason, in those moments, like I'm just really good at just like going into a zone, you know. So it didn't feel like there was that much importance to it. I was just so zoned in and focused. Yeah, it was weird. It's I love that feeling. Though. It's funny you say that you're you're not level-headed because to, to me you always come across, you know, complete killer mode. Like explain that to me. Where, where so it's somewhere underneath there. The, the, in yeah, there? I guess I guess sometimes I can turn it on, but for most of my life, yeah, I'm pretty emotional. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, yeah, I'm probably like one of the few guys like even at this point in poker. Like none of no players like me exist anymore. But even back then, I was probably like one of the few like tilters and like just like yeah punters. Like I, I yeah, there's few people like me even then. We got a first all in here. Uh, Tom Hall moving all in with pocket tens. Daniel Legrano is uh, taking his time here to the side on this hand. Um, summarize the first few days of this event for me. Was it was it smooth sailing to the t final table? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, day one, if I recall. It was just back and forth. It was a cool format because even like the very first hand, like you felt the importance. You know, I mean, there's 40 people left, you know, even <laughs> when, the, when it started. So uh, you felt the weight of the tournament. Yeah, but day one, nothing really happened. I think I had my normal stack. And then day two, I remember there was one hand where I made a big bluff on Trickett in like a four bet pot or something gone to fold. And that kind of propelled my chips up uh made the straight in one hand but i remember going to the final oh yeah then day two also i made one huge bluff probably like the biggest bluff of my life at the time for sure where it was like the final table bubble and everybody had like 30 big blinds and i was playing with antonio uh antonio you know antonio was trying to like run the table over a bit and i thought he was just three betting so wide and scott siever opened under the gun antonio three bet and then i four bet like a 30 big blind stack with queen jack suited and i when the action folded to me i was in the big blind and i was just telling myself please have like any hand reasonable like any suited cards whatever like this is the spot and like it was probably it's probably stupid to think like that but uh <laughs> i thought it was so good such a good spot and then i looked down at queen jack and i was like oh shit i told myself i'm gonna have to forfeit all in with anything and fuck this is as good as any and uh after like five seconds, like pumping myself up, like, okay, let's do it. And then I jammed, Scott, Scott folded right away. It's like, then Antonio, like two seconds later, he folds. And then from there, like, yeah, that just set the tone. And I was able to just stack up a bit. I had, yeah, I was able to get a good amount of chips going to the final table. So describe to me the adrenaline of live poker in, in a moment like that. Is that like one of the coolest feelings when you're like all in with Queen Jack suited there? yeah yeah no that was great uh yeah indescribable yeah because i mean there's so like i'm gonna have egg on my face if he just wakes up <laughs> like pocket kings you know it's like what the fuck did i just do like all my investors like dude come on like you played so reasonable up into this moment but uh yeah it worked out and it felt amazing we just lost Tom Hall. He busted out on the bubble. The final table uh, paid eight places. We're looking at the chip counts right now. Uh, Tobias Rinkemeyer, Dan Coleman, Daniel Legrand. Those are the three big stacks over there. And then Rick Solomon sitting in the two seat as well. The other four stacks are, are fairly short. So, um, you know, we're going to see some action quite quickly because obviously, you know, after the bubble bursting, Paul Newey sitting only on a few big blinds. Um, then at this final table, obviously you said you sold about 80% of yourself, still playing you know, for $15.3 million, not only for your bankroll, but also for all the investors. Um, did you feel pressure? Were you, you know, nervous on the bubble? How did you look at that? No, no, I didn't feel nervous on the bubble. Uh, I don't know, like my natural mindset is to just like, torch it almost where like I want to just like be aggressive and like find the spots where I can make make chips like I my whole poker career I never learned like ICM uh really bad really bad that I didn't even put the time into learning that but like I just wanted to like make chips and give myself a chance to play for first so in the bubble I was just like trying to think of like where can I like increase my stack you know where can I like who's who's feeling the bubble more than me who's feeling the pressure and then like what who can I get away with stuff first you know as far as the players at this final table, um, you've been playing on the tour that year and, you know, crushing left, re left, right and center. But who were the players that you were you know, impressed with as far as, you know, their style or their level of play? 
Yeah, so definitely Scott Seaver. I think probably at the time, like, I rated him as, like, as good as it gets, you know? Like, he's definitely, like, a, a field player, but he's just so, like, tuned in to, like, how everybody's playing, who he can exploit, who he can't. Like, what to, he, Scott's just such a good player, you know? Um, so I was definitely, like, he, I think he was short-stacked, though. Yeah, he was. Yeah, so, I mean, I was happy about that. Uh, who else was at the table? Uh, Vogelzang. Yeah, I guess uh, I knew he was a good player. Uh, Toby. Obviously, he's really good. I wasn't too concerned, uh, going to be honest, with, like, Negranu. Uh, Negranu, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and you had Negranu, Kerry Katz, and Paul Nui uh, at the table. My, my take on Negranu was that he was going to – he wanted to just go deep in the tournament, you know? So he probably didn't want to do something stupid either. Right. So I felt like I could probably get away with stuff for him as well. Yeah. What about what about the ultimate wild card, Rick Solomon? Like, what is he like? Because he, to me, from all that I've seen, is one of the most aggressive players ever. Um, and, and I wonder what your perception of him is. Uh, you know, I, I didn't play with him too much uh, at the time. Uh, my perception was he was going to... Yeah, I, I really don't know. Like, right. he, I, I think, like, at times he can be wild. At other times he can be kind of reasonable. Like, at some point, like, if he's losing chips, he might say, fuck it in spots. That's maybe what I was thinking. But apart from that, maybe he's, like, a little splashy and but, but reasonable overall, especially, like, this is we're playing for a lot of money. So, yeah. Right. We just saw Paul Nui double up, and he, he <laughs> tweeted this epic photo before making the final table. The He called himself the likely bubble boy because he was the shortest stack coming into the final <laughs> table. So clearly, you have to take a bubble bath in order to be the bubble boy. But maybe no, that not? maybe that sort of jinxed him the other way, um, seeing some footage here of uh, Paul Nui talking about his uh, love for the slot machines. Pa Paul is one of my favorite characters on the tour. Uh, I've, I've interviewed him many times. You know, I've had the pleasure to have drinks with him. Such a sweetheart. And, you know... Seeing him make the money here, you know, the money itself, you know, he has plenty of that. But just the accomplishment of making the money for him was, of, co of course, a huge deal. Um, and you are out there looking to torch it. And you're out there looking to, you know, yeah, raise some, step, ra on the gas. <laughs> step on the gas and, and go nuts. Um, how much of that sort of attitude came from the success you've had in previous months? How much was it sort of like confidence that you've g gathered over time? No, I, I don't think it was that. I think it's just my natural, like, uh, proclivity. Like, I just want to – I'm just always, like, aggressive in things. Like, I just want to – I just want to, like, take gambles and, yeah, I don't know. It's my personality, I guess. Right. So, you know, you told me earlier that you, you're, not, you're not playing poker anymore. You're not you, – like, you're focusing on, you know, just enjoying life for, uh, right now. Um, but if you have that mentality and that attitude and that mindset, you know – why are you not drawn to the game still? Because it can also be like addicting, right? That kind of feeling, that high, like that, that, yeah, that, that, mo sure. that, 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 that move every single time. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, one, like, I think even like how I was playing back then, I could take these huge gambles and like have everything on the line, but also know that I was, uh, I was a winning player. Um, and I never studied at poker. And I, I just really like, trial and error just played tons of hands. But then I, uh, just seeing how young kids were coming into the game and studying so much and the game was changing with solvers and I wasn't willing to just put tons of money on the line knowing I'm a losing player. Um, and also, I mean, like I realized I could get my thrills by snowboarding, like taking huge chance, like taking like big risks, like where I'm actually like truly enjoying life and uh, a lot more is on the line, snowboarding, like avalanche <laughs> areas, like going like off cliffs, stuff like that, you know, no fall zones. Uh, yeah, there's a lot more ways you can get thrills than torching your money on fire. So so that adrenaline junkie side is still inside of you. Oh, yeah. You're just getting yeah. it in a different way now. Exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. We just saw Paul Nui double up again. He um, back to back big hands where he doubled up, but still one of the short stacks. He was not sitting on a ton, uh, but definitely... Um, changed the situation at the table a fair bit. Um, Cirque du Soleil, heavily involved here as well. It was really cool to see the show and Gila Liberté for putting this on. And a lot of money went to charity as well from this event. Um, this this final table, you know, broadcast on ESPN. Uh, how often are you still reminded of this? Do people still recognize you? Hey, are you the guy from, from the poker tournament? Like, does, does that still happen? Uh, rarely, you know, maybe every, every now and then more so if I was in like Canada or Europe, even, even like Brazil, uh, South America, but I'll, poker stopped really playing, uh, on TV after black Friday, you know, in, in America. So I think that's one of the reasons, 
But yeah, not so much in America. Right. All right, we got Kerry Katzel in here with eights against Jax against Daniel Negreanu. Negreanu active early, um, getting lots of hands and being involved in lots of showdowns. Um, you're sort of sitting back. Um, if I recall correctly, all these hands we're seeing so far were sort of in the first hour, right? There was like tons yeah, of action. I, yeah, there was a lot of big hands in the beginning where short stacks had to get it in, if I recall. Yeah, a lot of people... Yeah, so we're basically seeing like hands that all happened uh, in a short span of time because we haven't seen you play a single hand yet, but also we haven't played that many hands to begin with. Well, it was a long bubble too, you know, on day two. So I think everybody came in pretty short stacked. Right. Uh, Van Locke on Facebook is saying, very humble to admit you're not as good as your competition as well as to admit that you you would be, you know, a, a losing player right now. Um, does, does that mean you've closed the door? It's not even being humble. It's just realistic. <laughs> realistic? <you know>? Like, <laughs> For sure, losing. Would, would would you also say that you've closed the door on on the game as a whole? Yeah. Or? Yeah. So so th there's no drive inside of you to ever like you know play again or even even just like rock up to play the main event for fun or something. Uh, I I play the main event. You know, actually, I play a Thursday night game with my friends back home, like ten dollars, and that's plenty of fun. But uh, for like high stakes or to actually like dedicate time to it definitely not wow that's awesome that's cool though because you have this epic memory now that you can always look back on and you know see the footage of what this poker life was like yeah and you know too like back then like the high stakes scene like the super high rollers they were a bunch of players that like i really like they were fun entertaining people like those like the old school germans like uh phil board uh tobias igor you know uh max altergott uh, all, all those guys like I enjoyed being around. So we're playing for a lot of money, and I'm also like enjoying myself, you know. Then like the new breed, uh, I mean, it probably says more about me than it does about them. But uh, I just didn't enjoy being around them and like their style of poker, like people staring at me. Like I remember like when Fedor was coming up, and he's just like staring at everybody from like a foot away. Like, what are you doing, man? Like, oh, it pissed me off so much. Like I was so annoyed by being around these people that like, and then I'm losing money to go with it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Just shoot myself. Yeah, I mean, I, I can imagine that that makes losing harder if you're not enjoying yourself. That's definitely yeah. uh, a tough spot. Um, I had Olivier Bosquet on this on this uh, very show last week, and you know, with Olivier, we also talked about your insane run that you had during this period of time. Um, when you think back of it, are you ever telling yourself like that was just stupid? How insane that run of, 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 of moments were because they were like back to back to back and then I told Olivia I said like yeah and then he didn't cash events for like eight months and he goes yeah but he, because he didn't any, he didn't play any events and then he showed up yeah. and he made the one drop final table again the next year mm -hmm. yeah I just totally stopped playing in, two, in 2015 and back then like people hadn't really been like catched up and I was like which I think such a huge thing in poker at, at that time it was like playing with confidence and people were thinking like wow, Dan, just mu Dan must be doing something different than everybody else. Even though, like, I would honestly do some stupid stuff every now and then that, like, didn't, people didn't have solvers to say that, like, what you're doing is wrong. So I would just do, like, some, like, head-scratching moves. But people would probably think, wow, he's just on a next level. Like, why, why is he doing that? <laughs> like, I would just do it with confidence. And I could tell, like, I'd get reactions. Like, ooh, maybe I should stay out of his way in these spots, you know? Um, where was I going with that? Uh, but yeah, back then I was uh, I was running really hot, obviously, and then stopped playing. Uh, and also, like when I I think my skill level was the highest. Uh, but looking back on that year, I think uh, at the time I honestly thought like I'm, I'm the chosen one, you know, like I deserve this. Like I, I'm so good, and how could I? I deserve to be winning every tournament. Because when you win like five in a row, like you're thinking like this must be skill, you know, <laughs> at least for me. Uh, and then it took some time to realize, like, no, I just got, like, supremely lucky there. <laughs> and, yeah, I'll, I'll walk away a winner. All right. We have got the most, one of the most interesting hands from this final table. Uh, for you guys who are just tuning in, this is Run It Back. I'm watching the 2014 Ooh. Big One for One Drop final table with the champion Dan Coleman. Um, this is the hand. Scott Seaver raises to 1.2 million. Tobias Rankemeyer calls, I believe, from the big blind with pocket aces. And then we got a four queen deuce uh, flop. So let's listen on the, in on the commentary. Lots of table talk. Dan, chime in whenever you want this might be like the best hand of the tournament i think so poker history this is amazing you think this is a leak in a lot of pros don't you the continuation oh, bet sure. is a continuation loss a million five from siever with the c bet called the big blind with aces right yeah he just defended the big blind yeah yeah like a 12 big blind stack i think was it that short i don't even know i'm not sure maybe it's like 15 20 20 tops wow here well just a call uh-oh, Seaver's gone into DEFCON mode. <laughs> he does have that other side of him. 
turn guard now. Jack of clubs. Rankemeyer still best. Seaver now open-ended. And Tobias has to worry now about a third club on board. Does Seaver just Whoa. jam the tire? Is that what happened? I think so, yeah. I haven't seen this in years, but I Tobias believe he did. I think he does for like a pot-sized bet. Scott, sitting on a park bench like this, I'd figure his wife had left him or his dog had been run over by a car or he just ate some really bad bulgogi. <laughs> We saw him continuation bet on the flop. Then when he keeps betting on the turn, I call that C-bet squared. It can win you a lot of pots or it can get you in a lot of trouble. I never see bet square. I'm all in. Wow, there's a player. That's so a pot size bet shove. All in for over 6.8 million. Boy, Seaver dangling on a cliff. I mean, that was that's that's uh, 11 bigs. Exquisitely. He's played yeah. like he's not strong. Okay, so how do we how do we get rid of aces here? How did that happen? Possible. Impossible. Let's listen in on the table talk because there's some good stuff coming. Seaver applying maximum pressure, or well, the maximum pressure he has, to oh, Rankemeyer, who has the bigger stack. World class. So is this like world class from Seaver or very bad from Toby? Very bad from Toby. I mean, I wonder, I don't think Toby's ever making this play. It's not this, like, big televised final table where maybe there's, like, glory of making, like, the best pocket aces fold of all time. I don't know. <laughs> there's an element of that to it because I don't see how you could ever fold here. It was either king, queen, or ace, queen. The only thing you would ever call. You're wrong, man. Oh, wow. I'm better than them. Ooh, that's a nice hand. The best starting <laughs> king of kings. Like, he's having, like, tons of, like, like ace, ten, like, the ace of clubs. Like. And also, Toby is, like, talking himself out of the hand. I understand. <laughs> Sometimes there's just nothing you can do. I know, I know. <laughs> it's brutal though. I right? know, it is brutal. <laughs> and on one drop too. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's like, yeah. but, but you can't sweat it, you know? These things just happen. <laughs> I could still throw my hand away. Yeah. No. I would look at you a little like... I know you I would. I would think less of you. I know you would. I know. <laughs> to his credit, Scott seems very comfortable. He just looks and sounds so casual and confident. I might think he's holding a monster. I know. I know, Scott. But honestly, I'd rather disappoint you and, and get away <laughs> if, you're, if you're ahead. And, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Okay. I think I should shut up now. <laughs> I mean, you don't have the ace queen. He's right. Unlikely. I don't think you would jam the king queen there. He's right again. So. You could have king 10 or 10 9, of course, for the club, but even against those hands. <clears throat> I wouldn't normally fold this, you know that stuff. Has Toby told Scott he has aces? Well, he told him that he has better than king queen, and then and then I think Scott said that do you have kings, and then he said better than that. Ooh, okay. So he basically telegraphed. Think you can't reveal your actual hand. Yeah. Is up. Yeah. Okay. So this is a snap call, right, for you? Yeah. Yeah. So like, what is what is Toby thinking here? That's what I'm so curious about. That's what everybody's curious about, yeah. <laughs> also, like, you know, I mean, I'm just like, you know, a recreational dude. Like, I love to play poker, but the fact alone that he underreps his own range so incredibly hard by calling yeah, that. exactly. Like, it's insane that to have aces in this spot, like, you're at the top of your range. Like, how could you ever fold? I mean, the funny thing is, is that if, if Toby ends up calling here, Scott could think this is the longest slow roll of all time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, just pause for the cameras for 10 minutes or whatever. And obviously, you're going to call these as bad and hands up folding. It's too sick. I mean, for the people who are watching right now, like, let us know what you think about this hand because it's still insane all these years later seeing this. And the aces are just like, you know, God, it's such a good hand. It is. My doctor doesn't examine me this thoroughly. <laughs> I think he folded it face up, too. Oh, he did. For all of Seaver's chips and almost all of Rankemeyer's chips. Well, Tobias with the best hand, <laughs> but if he's up against a flush, he's drawn dead. If he's up against a set, he's got two outs. If he's up against two pair, he's way behind.
Rankemeyer running out of time. And he folds. There's no chance that's aces. That would Impossible. be possible. No chance. So, how, how can you do that? Thoughts of that. Rankemeyer is stunned. Oh, nice end. What a risky move from Seaver. And I doubt he makes that move if he thinks Rankemeyer has aces. And I think the call for the clock saved Scott's life. Not his tournament life, his actual life. He wasn't breathing. <laughs> I mean, Scott is legit upset at Toby for folding there. He's yeah. like, what are you yeah. doing? <laughs> he really doesn't like he's pissed off, right? Yeah, he's like, dude, what are you doing? Like, I, I, If you have aces, you have aces. Like, it's, wow. I'm still in shock. All these. And you know, too, like, Toby wasn't the one at risk. You know, he would have, like, four million chips left. Right, right. Yeah, there's... I gotta get Toby on the show. We gotta, we gotta yeah, hear, absolutely. we gotta hear the definitive breakdown of this. I mean, it's insane. Lines are up to 400, 800, and like, and a you know, Scott seems to be in shock still. Like, oh, King Ten. Here we go, King Ten for Toby. Now let's see if he gets creative with this. Um, for people in the chat, we are watching the 2014 Big One Four One Drop Final Table with the champion Dan Coleman. Um, haven't seen Dan put a single chip in the pot as we are watching this final table with. Trust me, you, he, he will eventually put chips in the pot and we'll go over some of those hands that are being played. Um, that hand was like super long too, right? When you were sitting there, it was like 10 minutes or something? Yeah, yeah, it was probably 10 minutes on the river decision alone. So insane. Um, as far as the way you are playing at a final table, you know, what are things you look for? What are things you are focused on when you're not in the hand? Because clearly there's a lot of things happening you're just sitting there. Do you pay attention to different things while yeah, you were? It, like all my poker tournaments on day one, I can't pay attention for the life of me. I'm probably one of the worst day one players ever. But like day two, day three on, I'm just so focused on the table. Like I'm not looking at my phone. I'm just just paying attention to every hand, like every person's like demeanor, I'm trying to get a feel for like how each person is playing and how they're, how they're interpreting the table, you know, like, what they think is going on. Yeah. So at this point, yeah, I, I probably, it's probably not something I could articulate, but I'm just getting like a total feel for the table as a whole, you know, how each person's like their mood, like right. how, the weight of the tournament for them. Like if, if they're really looking to just like stay in and not make a big mistake, um, if they're looking to really like press the action and maybe like get out of line, you know, all those things. And then kind of like uh, calibrating my play based on that. Were you, you you always referred to yourself as just like a field player. Um, yeah. Does it also mean that you were very focused on, you know, live tells and remembering certain habits? No, no. Uh, I guess maybe I do something to like try and get something out of someone, like ask them a question or do something with my chips to see how they, if they make a move or adjust their body language, whatever. But then from there, it's like they give you something. It's not like, oh, now I know for sure it's that. And I was like, oh, shit, okay, so he did that. Let me really think about this and then make some, make a guess, a, a guesstimate on it, you know? Right. Do you feel as though a lot of your accomplishments in poker come from, come, come from talent? Or do you think it's also hard work, not by studying, but by just playing a ton? I think it was mostly talent combined with maybe belief because I just always played heads up and against people better than me and always thought like I, I know I can beat this person maybe not now maybe they're better than me but like I'm going to keep trying and I'll go broke I'm happy to go broke until I find out if they can beat me um, and back then it, it worked and I was able to just put in so many hands against good players and learn a thing or two from them as they beat me and then improve my game based on that and take another crack at them, like rebuild my bankroll. And for whatever reason, yeah, I it worked out and I was able to get pretty good that way. Massive cooler here. Solomon against Vogelsang. Both made trips. Yeah. Vogelsang knows he's best. He's a very deliberate player, likely trying to figure out what size raise he thinks will extract more chips from his napping neighbor. The funny part about Solomon is, is that Solomon plays these kinds of hands to try to, you know, break someone who plays a tighter range. So he's always... Oh, exactly. This is his thing. Yeah, I call. 
And there is the double up. Almost nothing the amateur Solomon could do. Nice hand, nice hand, nice hand. Tough one to fold, but at that point, his 8-7 was likely only good against the bluff. Rick Solomon now. Do you think there's there's a, a path there to folding on the river when, when Vogelsang shoves? I mean. I don't know. Especially when you're Rick and you know you play all these crazy hands and you're probably thinking like, if people are going to try and bluff me out, bluff me over the pot sometimes because they know that I'm, I don't know. I don't see how Rick can fold there. Right. You're right. That's exactly how Rick plays. Like I see him versus these like tight older guys in big cash games where they're, they have like ace king, but Rick has like five, three suit and he flops of trips like that, you know, and then just gets so many, so many, uh, so much money from them. So yeah, this is game. I feel like Rick Stallman is like a nine, five suited guy. Who like oh yeah you know if there's if there's a raise in two callers like nine five suited is never ever ever hitting the mock which it's it's a beautiful hand all right we got another all in here let's listen in Jack called by Paul Newey with King Queen Newey barely has him covered come on ace ball A's of is is Jack four no oh, then give the swap oh. all hearts ace Jack ace. four all hearts the flop trade nine eight ace high still leads. Not sure about Newey's decision here to risk most of his chips with King Queen. Jack, Jack of Hearts. Ace. Ace of Diamonds. Turn card. You left on Paul Rudy for the same. Newey looking Ace for paint. Oh, Trey. All good so far for Rankemeyer. I stay with the Ace of Diamonds. Ace of Diamonds. Only a king or a queen would send Tobias Rankemeyer home. Are we going to be six handed or will Tobias double up? The river card is a six. Rankemeyer will go up. Maybe that hand will help him forget a little bit that he folded those aces and he could have had, you know, a massive, massive stack. Knew he taking a big hit here. Um, lots of people in the chat, lots of uh, banter going on about these hands. Um, for people that are uh, asking, is this live? Well, this conversation is live. This final table happened back in 2014. We are breaking it all down. We're having some fun with it. And we're reliving, reliving some of these stories from uh, Dan Coleman's uh, poker career, which is now over. It's over. It's ended. It's done. And we are just reliving one of these uh, big moments here as, you know, we all watch this back happen in uh, in real time um you know via live reporting or you know via streams and and, and whatnot and then later on espn um and now on poker go so we're excited to uh bring you all this coverage let's have a listen in here on this show all in for just over a million a little choice there siever in the small blind with 10 8 and he's thinking atc any two cards for that amount there's a call yeah, Seaver with not much of a hand, but in the small blind. 675 more to call and maybe knock out Nui. Ace four of hearts for Rick Solomon in the big blind. Two, 275 more. And he needs a little more to make the call. It's yeah. He tried to get the ex Paris Hilton boyfriend discount there. <laughs> Solomon could have re raised their lawn, but he short stacked himself. More. The ante is almost four of us. Almost four of us. A three way flop. Pots right? Okay. Dry side pop. If there's any betting, a side pot between Seaver and Solomon. Check. Deuce seven king, two hearts. Seaver misses. Solomon with a nut flush draw. Seaver checked it. Solomon bets one and a half million. Seaver folds. So Rick Solomon one on one. So, so let me ask you this, Dan. Is it is it important to realize your equity here with a player all in here, basically with no side pot in, in the in the spot where Solomon bets his strong draw, or would you say that it's bet in Solomon's favor to keep checking? I'm not sure. <laughs> I really have no idea. If I'm Solomon, I probably bet, but I'm not confident that's the right way to play. Right, but you would probably bet because your equity is pretty good against any hand there. Yeah, I don't know. I, I bet, but I'm not sure. Maybe it's bad. There it is for Solomon. The heart on the turn. Paul Newey getting eliminated. Solomon takes out Paul Newey. All right, we're down to six players here at the 2014 Big One for One Drop Final Table. Dan Coleman, we still have not seen you play a hand, man. This is insane. I know. Yeah, we, let the other players go at it. We got, we, got, we, got, we got plenty of hands to cover, though, because... Um, we also, like, we're so short stacked, like, there's only so much you can do, you know? Sometimes it's good to just let the short stacks go after each other. I don't know. Yeah, no, that, that's very true, obviously. Something that wasn't there. So basically, the play before the final table was far more interesting, if you look back on it. Yeah, I think so. Right. Me too, yeah, especially the final table bubble, like, went on for so long, and yeah, there's there's some interesting hands there. Yeah, exactly. 
All right, we are down to six players. If you guys in the chat have any questions for Dan about this moment, about his poker career, please let me know. We're going to try to uh, to break you know more stuff down as we get closer and closer to the heads-up action, which obviously has tons and tons of hands for Dan to break down because that was a big, big moment as you played heads-up against Negranu. All right, quick look at the chip counts here. You can clearly tell you've been folding for a few orbits. You started with 22 million, I believe. You're down to 15.5. Um, stacks are drawing a little bit closer after a few eliminations. Um, Negranu now with the commanding lead and vocal saying who just doubled up through rick solomon so that's where we stand right now the three americans at the bottom two germans and a canadian wait how did negrano get all those chips did he go into the final table with the chip lead um he was sort of tied for the lead with oh, he knocked out carry cats the first hand right he busted tom hall and he busted carry cats oh okay. right yeah. so that's how he got some uh Ooh, got some oh there. look at this player here all right what do you see as a dishwasher and had a reputation as a very aggressive media adverse dishwasher that's a welcome sight to a shrinking stack a raise to 1.6 million rankemeyer with pocket fives and the small blind it's a good goal push the action a lot so rankemeyer might not give him credit for a real big hand here you got me covered or how much did you start like 15.5 both have about 20 so beautiful he's asking those questions just thinking like please go all in please go all in like you got 20 big lines snap call a monster pot that coleman has a firm grip on right now with pocket aces but he is the one at risk come on five so th this this is so shallow now that uh you know even the fives are a pretty good shove there i mean i believe the blinds are at least 300 600k oh yeah maybe four eight hundred already yeah yeah he has 20 big lines Livens every all in situation. Coleman's ace. So, when, when Dan Coleman, the ad adrenaline junkie, is all in with aces, um, is there anything going on on the inside? Is your heart rate going up? How do yeah, you know? I'm just thinking to myself, I know I'm going to get fucked right here. I know he's going <laughs> to That's probably how every gambler thinks, right? You're just you're ready to be mad at something that hasn't even happened yet. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> just I'm so screwed here. Right. So unlucky. I was coming on the river, of course. Oh, yeah, standard. <laughs> needs a five to knock out Coleman. The river card is a tray. Does he have more than you? Well, Coleman thinks he's knocked out Tobias. But Coleman was the shorter stack. Take your 1.6 back. Oh yeah, Tobias has almost two people. Alright, so big, big double up, especially Huge. at a fi at a final table where these stacks are so short. The equity alone in hand like this is just completely insane. Um and still, you know, still not a lot of room to play. I'm realizing this now as I'm watching it, how shallow this final table really was. It was like a turbo sit and go almost. Yeah. Yeah, especially at this point. All right. So now you're still trailing the ground by a bit. Yeah, but you're... He's the chip leader. He has 38 million. That's like 50 big blinds, you know? Yeah, that's true. That's like 20, yeah. Oh, look at this. The cheering section. Haralabob and uh, Olivier on the rail. Um, did you, did you like, you know, talk about hands and stuff on the rail at all? Or did they just leave you do your thing? Uh, left me be. That's kind of cool because you see some players, you know, they go to the rail all the time. They, you know, ask advice, they ask for advice where they go over like charts and stuff, but you were just like in, in your own zone. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty awesome. That's really cool. All right, we got um, Ed, Edmund saying hi from Honduras. And um, we got a lot of people in the chat. Maybe you know Edmund. I don't know. He says hi from Honduras. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um, tons of people in the chat just, you know, still going nuts about the Aces hand. Um, which is really, really funny. And Toby's aces. Yeah, Toby's aces. Yeah, we're still, yeah crazy. still talking about that hand. Um, Tyler John is asking actually a really good question. Why did you stop playing? Like, what was the what was the reason? Yeah, I mean, I just didn't really enjoy poker anymore. And like, of all the things you can do in life, like, why would I be doing something I don't enjoy? And I'm losing money at, you know? Right. Um, I so feel like it only makes sense to play poker your whole like. Uh, I'm very lucky, very fortunate that I went on the run that I did in poker where like I far outkicked my coverage, you know. Um, I, I I won so much in tournaments that I, I shouldn't have made nearly as much. So like, I'm happy to watch. The only way it makes sense like, if I'm comfortable enough to not need to play poker and to keep playing, I think it would only make sense if I live like a thousand years, you know, <laughs> like life's too short to be playing poker. Right. I don't so do you feel as though you went out on top or did you have, you know, a losing stretch that went into you deciding, okay, now I got to just quit? Not that big of a losing stretch. Uh, yeah, 2017, 2018, I lost a little bit, but it was like going up and down, but I just knew I was in spots. Like I was, I didn't want to, I was just playing super high rollers and 
I could tell the kids I was playing with, I was in spots where I was like, I don't know why they're doing this. And like, they're putting me in tough spots. And like, they're clearly more confident. I, I knew that like they were playing better than me. Right. And I was like, it also, honestly too, like I, I, I enjoyed poker because it was something that I got really good at. And I enjoyed that. I was good at it, you know? And now I know like, now I'm playing a game that I know I'm bad at. It's just making me feel bad. And I know that like, I didn't care to put in the work. It wasn't interesting to me anymore. It wasn't interesting having a solver tell me what to do. Like I wanted to try and like outwit somebody, be clever in spots and beat them, you know? Um, and now they're using a computer that tells them what to do and they're crushing me. You know? <laughs> right. No, that makes sense. Uh, we just lost Scott Seaver here in the hand. You guys could all follow the hand as um, Negron who had uh, the Jack three, the, the classic Jack three offsuit called the race from the big blind and Seaver got it all in with 10, five suited on, uh, I want to say Jack ten nine. Um, it was it was very very shallow stacks though so that's how uh, Seaver ended up going all in, um, or maybe it was a blind battle. Sorry guys, sorry guys, I was listening to Dan. We're having a good conversation here. Can't expect me to pay attention to the action at the same time if we're not you know fully di diving into this uh, in the hands that are being played. Um, but we have plenty of hands to be played. Let's listen to Scott actually. I mean, there was a hand against Tobias Rankemeyer where you got him to fold aces with some great table talk. How does that work for you? What 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 are you trying to do and and how are you kind of manipulating his thoughts and emotions? Every situation is just different. I've played a lot with Tobias over the years. We have a very close rapport, and I just thought I could say and do the right things to let him think that this was a spot where I had it. We see you playing in some incredible tournaments all over the world. What makes the One Drop a tournament that you wanted to come and play? The One Drop is so special, honestly, primarily because of the charitable organization attached to it. Being able to be a part of something that donates so much money and goodwill to the world is really great and hopefully it sparks interest in more poker players to want to try and make a little change thanks so much for talking to wow us. scott so you're so well spoken here on the charity doesn't get that much tv time to you know speak his mind but when he does get it he uh Definitely makes the most of it. Um, you know, I, I mean, you and I have done a podcast before. If people want to just look up Dan Coleman, Remco Rinkema, you can find the podcast that we did in which we went in depth on, you know, the, the media situation that we had back in the day. And I even admitted, you know, I was not on Dan's side back when this all happened. But, you know, perspectives change. You learn about people. You learn about situations. And, you know, that is very important on, on the journey that we are all on in life. Um, but just because I'm getting tons of questions, can you explain once again why, you know, the media aspect of this whole endeavor this big final table was something you weren't particularly interested in um yeah i guess it's multifaceted uh part like i it's kind of like a circus event you know like playing for a million dollars in a poker tournament it's so it's so ridiculous and like i don't know i don't, I don't think like making money should be glorified like that and like yeah i'm, I'm a did I'm a gambler and like I'm playing because I want to make money, but I don't think other people should. I think I'm like a flawed person, you know, like that I care for this and I don't want to be the person that is used by the, the poker media to like get other people in the game, other young kids that might think, wow, this young kid was able to do this. It, fuck it, having like a normal career. I'm going to try and make it gambling. So I think 90, 999 times out of a thousand, it goes disastrous. Um, so I, I didn't want any part of that. I didn't want to have people use me as like a pawn to get more people into the game and maybe ruin their lives. For sure, for a lot of people, they're responsible. They can play poker and get, get enjoyment out of it. Uh, but I don't think that makes up for the people that's lives are left in shambles from it. Right. Um, another is just like the idea of like the cult of self and how – in America and in the world at large, we like to just talk about individual success. And I don't know, I, I didn't want to be a part of that either. So Right, I understand. Looking back on it now, do you feel like you've handled it the, the right way with the information that you had back then? Or would you have done anything different? Uh, I wish I didn't give a fuck. I, back then, like I felt bad about it. I was like, wow, like maybe I shouldn't have done this. Maybe, uh, yeah, it would have been easier if I just did some interviews. Um, but I, if I knew it, if if who I am now won that, like I'd do the same thing, but just not give a damn. And right, hey, I'm being myself, you know. Right. All right, we got uh, Negron here flop, <laughs> flopping a Ooh. diamond flush with the open and a straight flush draw. No big deal uh, against uh, Rankemeyer, who is all in, and we don't have his cards yet. And Vogel saying who has the open and a straight draw, but no diamonds at all. 
gonna give it up. That's not good news. Yeah, yeah. Flop <laughs> for Negreanu. Maybe Tobias has bigger diamonds. Maybe Tobias has a set. I know. That's that's potential. Yeah. Got one out. Oh, yeah. Middle pair. Sure and. Uh, uh, yeah. so bad. Almost dead here, Tobias Rankemeyer. Um, to go back with one more question about that whole situation. Don't you feel as though it would have been much easier if you had just said the things that you just told me and that would have been like, you know, the two minute soundbite that people could use, you know, sort of make people aware of the risks involved? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, I guess, like, honestly, too, like playing poker at this level, like on this stage and for three days straight, just being so zoned into the table and just like being hyper alert, trying to make sure I'm not making mistakes, seeing what other people are doing and then playing for so much money and then Honestly, absolutely loving it from the final table, like down to heads up and then winning that adrenaline dump combined with like the mental endurance of having to be so focused for so long. Like, I just wanted to get the hell out of there. You know, like I didn't want to think about things like I was just drained. Right. Um, no, that that makes it easier to say like, hey, I, I mean, it was my, like who I am. I didn't want to do an interview. I, and I don't like to be the center of attention on that stage either. Right. Um, but also I was just so tired and I just wanted to be done with it also, you know? Yeah. No, totally understandable. And also, you know, for the people who are wondering, you know, what we're watching right now, it's just, this is like six, seven years ago. You, you, you turned 30 now. Yeah, you, yeah. you were 23 back then. So it's pretty insane to think about, you know, how much that even changes a person. Just, you know, a few extra years of experience. Um, yeah, for sure. And also what I'm curious about then after, because we're watching this final table unfold right now. We're going to break down the hands as they come. And by the way, we got Solomon all in here with the uh, pocket eights. Coleman wonders if he wants to risk more than one third of his stack with ace 10 off. Oh yeah, we're coming along. <laughs> Tough to get a read on the Panama hat. Look at the lines here. 500K, oh. 1 million. There is the call from Coleman. Negranu folds. And so it's about the best they could each hope for. Rick with a made hand. I want to say that you're right, 500, 1 million, but it's so silly that it's not on screen. So it's hard to hard to properly gauge, but yeah. Big flip once again. And, and you know, as you probably are thinking, you're, gonna, you're, you're never gonna win this one, right? Yeah, see, honestly, I think this might be a fold, actually, and I'm just so willing to get it in. Uh, I feel like it might be a fold, but what, what the hell do I know? Well, yeah, but that's a good call. You, you made a good call now. Yeah, <laughs> great call. I wonder if Solomon's beard is like a Stanley Cup beard. Will he shave it when he gets eliminated? <laughs> Solomon looking for help. Turn card, seven of diamonds, not what he needed. Close, though. <laughs> One chance left for Rick Solomon. Solomon needs an eight and an eight only, or he is wamboozled. River card's a queen, and that brings this chapter in Solomon's poker career to a close. Wow, another another flip you won, another showdown you won, while you know the, the, the pessimist inside you probably thought that there was no chance we were going to win that flip. Eight is coming for sure. <laughs> We're down to three-handed already. I mean, this is pretty nuts. We've seen lots of eliminations. You've been involved in two big showdowns. You're still second in chips behind Negreanu. Uh, now yeah, it's it was just so short, so short stacked at the final table where there was no interesting hands, this, apart from Seaver getting Toby to fold the aces. It was really just all-ins and the short stack busting, you know? And then finally we can play some poker three-handed. Right. Here we are three-handed. It's Christoph Vogel this saying... So this is probably the dumbest play in my... <laughs> All right, tell me. Tell me about it. You, you, it's, it's 501 million. Uh, are the I, mean, I just limped the fucking button with 9-5 off, you know? Like, at least min-raise. I forget Vogel saying stack, but, like, I was just trying to... I mean, so my whole poker playing of the past couple of years at this point was playing heads-up sitting goes, and we are short-stacked, and, like, nine, you don't fold the button, really, you know, with, a, with most of your hands. So 9-5 off, like... I'd be limping, but three handed and like ICM considerations, like you just can't do this. This is so bad. I mean, were you just overly uh, eager to be creative? Yeah, I was overzealous and just willing to, I just want to put people in tough spots and go crazy. Yeah. I think I just want to like make people play for all their chips. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so in hindsight, you're calling this crazy, but back then you must've thought like, well, you know, I can, I can do so many creative things exactly. by, by playing my range yeah. like this. Yeah, exactly. Like maybe back myself into a corner, but like fire my way out of it. I don't know. But that's a cool mentality to have, though. You don't see that all too often. Like even right now, you know, you make a top pair and Daniel happens to have a better top pair. Um, 
the hand that you have is is something they'll never expect at showdown but also while it gives opportunities it also creates a lot of issues that you know you could have avo yeah. avoided by just folding or I mean, the game starts with like your pre-flop hands like mistake pre-flop just builds on itself later on and here we are is that, that though. you folded it very fast too yeah um, is that one of those classic moments where, you know, a friend who, you know, plays poker for fun tells you like, so I was on the river and this happened and you're like, no, 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 but what happened before? Is it like, tell me, tell me the whole story. That That's nine, five offsuit basically where yeah, you're, yeah, exactly. in, you're in a spot on the turn and you're like, how did I get here? Yeah, totally. That's pretty funny. Um, so three handed, there was a bit more play. Um, seeing you limp uh, on the button with nine, five off, does that mean that, you know, you were trying to play as many hands as possible? Yeah. And I was just trying to play a ton of hands. Yep. So here you check behind with the uh, ace nine from the big blind. Uh, okay, I'll do this one. Great board for Negreanu's hand. A million five from Negreanu. Coleman contemplating if his ace high is still good. It would be a lot of the time. Twenty-three year old from outside Boston makes the call. Turn card now, six of spades. Negrano's pair of fives still ahead, despite the straight draw on board. Holman what are you checking. thinking here? You're you're underrepping your range. Ace high is, is, is good, three-handed. I mean, he's never, if he checks here, he never has a seven. And then when the deuce comes, yeah, he just never has a straight, right? Um, I wonder what i do if the deuce doesn't come. No, I still bet huge. I still make a giant bet. But uh, what's the board period? So six million in the middle. I was thinking at the time, like, hmm, 12 million would probably get the job done, but nah, he never has a seven. Let's just make it, like, for sure he's, he's never calling. This uh, is incredible. 15 yeah. million into 6 million. So you, you got to that number, 15 million, by thinking 12 million might not be enough? Yeah, yeah. Is is this like one of the things that set that set you apart back in those days? Sort of, you're you're thinking, okay, the seven is never in his range. I'm just going for it. Like that's yeah, I was just willing to go for it. Absolutely, go for it. And it's cool too if, if people are watching this and like you know everyone has run into situations where you know you know almost certainly it's going to be a split pot, but almost every time it goes check check or some some you know some very defensive bet. But right. so I think people nowadays might play more similar to this, but back then like. Somebody might just take a stab at it with like a half pot bet, you know? But yeah, I was just willing to really put max pressure. I, I love it. I mean, it's honestly so much more fun to watch. And that's one of the things I give sort of the GTO guys credit for. And, and I've learned this myself, you know, being in poker is that GTO usually invites people to be aggressive because it says, you know, you have to have bluffs here too. So you have to also, you know, swing yeah, for the fences. Yeah, it a fun game for sure, GTO. Right. Do you, do you still do you still stay in touch with you know people in poker? Do you still you know every now and then watch or you know catch anything uh, that's no, happening? I, I don't watch poker at all. Uh, I, I stay in touch with like, the people I came up with in Heads Up Sitting Goes. I'm close with a lot of those guys. Like, we used to share lobbies together all the time. Uh, it came up together. Stay in touch with those guys. And apart from that, just a couple of guys that played like the super high rollers. That's it. Right. So so, so so you're not in tune, you know, with what all the young kids are doing these days. I don't pay attention at all. Don't it, watch like online poker. Don't look at like big series, like tournament series. I don't know any events that go on. Yeah. It'd be so much fun to like watch like a super high rollable final table with you from like 2020, just sort of <laughs> to, to get your thoughts on like the strategies because you know, it's, it's obviously changed so much. Uh, and oh, like a super high rollable that goes on today. Well, like, I mean, there, there, there's nothing happening right now, but you know, in, right, right. In, and see what I, yeah. Oh man. My see, commentary would be hilarious. Yeah. All right, we got a big all-in here. We got Vogel saying with the king jack against Negrano's king ten here. Vogel saying very short, sitting on uh, just shy of nine big blinds, uh, but he has the best hand, so we'll see. We haven't had many bad beats yet. You know what that? Best hand is always held. Yeah, it's not going to this time. <laughs> Don't flip the script. A huge pay jump for the remaining players if the bad beat comes. And the crazy part is, while we watch the showdown as well, is that this this sort of sparked Vogel Sang's career. He like went on an absolute sort of Dan Coleman esque heater in in the years that followed, which is kind of funny to think about. Yeah, what a brutal person to play with too. By the way, wearing the scarf, going so slow on every decision. I mean, obviously amazing player, but like if everybody played like Vogel Sang, the game does not 
run, you know, nobody was going to sign up to play. He's obviously a crusher and doesn't make it fun for a single person. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of funny, right? How a select few people are totally fine with being that sort of almost like a villain. Yeah, he's a villain. being a parasite, you know, all he's doing is taking, you know, doesn't have enjoyment to the game. Like, I was saying, like, he's a nice guy, you know, but like, I, I don't understand, like, the disconnect of being like a nice guy and like he's considering all other areas of life. But like when playing poker and money's on the line, like just be so like, I don't know. It, it's really brutal for me. It right. tilts me even to think about today. Yeah, it's kind of nuts when you think about how Vogel saying is never really spoken about as far as, you know, table presence in a positive light. Everybody always says he's a nice guy, but. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, cause yeah, like he's not a bad guy. He's a nice guy in all the areas, but in poker, like he's just happy to just take from, take from everyone and not create any value, you know, I'm not any level of enjoyment. It's like, it makes you actually like think like, so who is he really at his core then? You know, if he's going to do something like this for a lot of money, I don't know. Right. For the people watching in the chat, let us know. How do you feel about Christoph Vogel saying? I mean, clearly, you know, the scarf and the tanking and the stare downs and, you know, not, not a lot of talking. It's easy to it's easy to not be a big fan. Um, at the same time, total killer at the table. If you respect his level of gameplay, then maybe that is something to be said for that. Um, but it, even like pre-flop, he's taking like 30 seconds to just check check back with like 10-9 off or whatever, you know, just like a and totally standard hand. Like he just wants to stay balanced. He cares so much about being balanced in every situation. Like, I don't know. Right. Did you did you ever call people out on that at the table? Were you no, all the who, time? Yeah. All the time, would call people up for staring staring at me from a foot away and then tanking so long in these situations. Yeah, in yeah, totally standard standard spots. So when you get conf confrontational like that, how does that go? Is it like a you know like you know what are you doing or is it like? Yeah, I'm just frustrated. Like, come on, man! Like, are you seriously doing this right now? Yeah, the, the one the one player that I always respected so much. And like still crushes eight. It makes me happy to see is Jason Kuhn. But like even like he knows like, hey, I might not be being balanced by checking back right here, but like let's make the game enjoyable. Let's let it flow. Um, so I always respected that, like seeing him like still crush and it's like, okay, good. You know, he's like one of the good guys. Like he cares about like the game and making it enjoyable for everyone. Yeah. When you when you have an opponent or when you used to have an opponent that acted slow or did a lot of staring, did that make you want to beat them even more? No, it just tilt me and make me play bad. <laughs> So, so it works for them. So it works. So there, yeah. <laughs> it, it's funny that you can reveal that now, but that's actually funny that this. Oh no, was... I'm sure it was so obvious to everyone playing that that I was getting tilted. So yeah. you would like you would chase like trying to like bust them and stuff. Yeah, or just like try and scorch my stack on fire just to not be at the table anymore. Yeah. Right. Uh, people are are wondering if I'm ever going to have Jerry Yang on the show. If someone has Jerry Yang's phone number, just let me know. I'll call Jerry Yang and I'll try to get him on the show. Watching the 07 main event final table with him, it'd be my pleasure. Uh, oh, ja yeah. Jamie, Jamie Gold, by the way, will happen. I'll have Jamie Gold on the show. Yeah, Jamie Gold and Jerry Yang. Were those back-to-back -back years? Yeah, Is they were. 2007, 2008? No, uh, uh, six and seven. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those were two classic final tables. Yeah. I've already had uh, Moneymaker, Hashem, and Raymer on the show. So that was incredible. Um, I spoke to Peter Eastgate. He wasn't interested. You know, Eastgate has moved past poker. I've always been so curious about Peter Eastgate. Uh, I have so much respect for him that, like, he was able to just, like, get – he knew poker wasn't for him, like, walked away a winner and, like, never asserted himself, like, back in, like, the poker world. Like, just walked away. I've always been curious, like, what he's up to. Yeah, I reached out and he said, sorry, not interested. He, he, his quote was, I've talked about this final table enough, which, you know, fair enough. To, fair enough to him, he probably has. Yeah. Um, big hand here with you. You got the um, trips here. Vogel saying leads into you, 2.75. Um, recall this hand or? Big money awaits all. Just a call from Coleman. And I don't know what language it was in, but Vogel saying just uttered a bad word in his head. So that hits Vogel saying and could be painful if he's There's some showdown value there for Vogel saying on the river. Maybe without the 10, he fires again. Yeah, I think so. 10 probably fucked me. Bet the turn after missing. Hits the river and now checks. I don't think he has many chips behind him. He has like six million or something. Yeah, he's he's by far the shortest of the three of you for sure. Yeah, he hung around for a while. Well, I mean, it's easy to hang around if you just don't make any decisions. Wow, he only had four point five million behind. Queen, ace, king into a bluff. I, I wonder if he has the balls to fire the river for Brooks. That's what I'm curious about too. Yeah. 
the rest of his chips. Take down the flash draw. F7. And Vogelsang knows that Coleman knows that. So Vogelsang might call this. It is for his tournament life. Vogelsang short stacked. I remember really thinking here that I was getting the call. Oh, yeah? Yeah, the way he was talking, like he had so many, so few chips left. Like, okay, he's just throwing the rest in. For 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 players like myself, or you know, beginning players, or people who are just recreational, hearing a top player out loud talk about his the ranges that are happening is so interesting because this stuff happens in his head if the action is not closed. But now right. the action is all he's all he has to do is call or fold, and then when he's going through the range in that way, it's just so fascinating. When yeah, you, I mean, third play to Vozing, I mean, he takes so long. Like I'm sure, like he's thinking at a way higher level than I am about poker, you know. So like he's probably really like doing all these like calculations in his head and thinking just everything, you know. So yeah, yeah I'm sure there's some spots where he's just timing like time banking just to be balanced. But yeah, I mean, he's definitely thinking at a high level. Right. So. Right. so as far as your thought process during the hand, you know, how, I mean, I, I'm not sure what the right way is to put this, how busy or how crazy was it inside your head during these moments? Or were things very clear to you usually? Not that crazy. I mean, but I wasn't playing like the same level people are playing today. Uh, I just like, just playing so many hands heads up in post-flop situations. Like I just thought like, oh, this is what I do with this hand. You know, I'm not like crunching numbers and thinking like their ranges, how many combinations of this hand. It was like, oh, with this spot, like in the, I played like 10 million hands the past few years against high level competition. And yeah, this is what I did and it worked out. And if it wasn't working, I'd change it up. So at this point I played so much, I was really kind of like settled into my game that I wasn't really deviating much from it, you know? Here is uh, the raise with King Queen off, the ground of calls with pocket fives, Vogel saying ace four and a very short stack in the big blind. Makes a stand. Now all in the middle. I think it's actually a raise. It's I more call. than 50%. Coleman calls. Triple up. <laughs> you snap called, like inviting Daniel into the into the pot. Yeah. There they are. So a two-man posse will try to hunt down Vogelsang. Yeah, tough duty for Kristoff <laughs> here, having to beat two players. Do six, eight. Negranu still leads. Check. check, check. No reason for either to bet. Turn card. Another six. Negrano is still best. Check, check. check. Get Bulzing out of here. <laughs> check, check. Fives. That's winning. Daniel with another knockout. Good game. Good game, bud. That was so tough right here because, like, heads up is all I was playing. And, like, finally this is heads up and this is my arena, you know? Like, this is where I can, like, just crush. Yeah. So, so as far as your approach to heads-up play, knowing that you had all this experience and, and being excited about this big moment, um, did you have a, 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 an idea of how Daniel would play and how you would approach trying to beat him? No, I, I didn't care about how he was going to play. Uh, like I had my set game that I would play in heads-up sitting goes, and then based on how people were playing, like as I started playing, I'd make these adjustments. and like It was all, all generalizations, but like as soon as I saw him show a few hands down, also I, mean, I was playing him for like this whole final table. I don't think we played much on day one or day two, but an idea of his game, then I was just going to make like my normal adjustments based on that, you know? Um, but I had all my, my bet sizes down. And, and one thing I like to do was just, I wanted to really show him that like I was in control, like knew what I was doing. So like I would have my bet sizes before like the flop or turn or like pre-flop and just like snap. Like that's what I'm doing. Even if it's a big bet, like I know this is my bet size on this board. Like, Boom, it's right in, you know. Uh, I just wanted him to be, like, second-guessing himself. Like, oh, shit. Like, Because one thing that's nice is, like, if I'm showing that I'm so confident that if he's in, like, big spots where he's uncomfortable, I think he's more likely to make a mistake or even avoid getting to that spot to begin with. He'll fold more in, like, flops and turns. Just, you know, it's like, fuck, I'm going to be lost on the river. This, is good. this mistake's going to compound even further if I put in this turn bet. So I just want to win all those chips, you know, and just, like, show, like, total confidence for him. Right. So how long was this heads up battle and, and was there enough play for you to really get your edge? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm not sure how many hands we played. It's probably like 50 or so. I really don't know. But yeah, there, there was enough. I, I had a really big edge here. Right. For the people in the chat, thank you so much for staying with us here on both YouTube and Facebook. People are already asking, who's the guest on Thursday? Well, how about you guys enjoy this show? We're, we're live right now. Uh, but my guest on Thursday is Greg Merson. We're watching the 2012 main event final table, so that should be uh, should be incredible. And I'll try hey, to get... Greg, 
do you mind if I take a quick break to use the bathroom? Absolutely. Take a break. We'll uh, talk to the right. chat and everyone watching right here as Dan Coleman is playing heads up for millions of dollars here against Daniel Negreanu. So for the people in the chat, one thing I have not said even once on this show today is if you like what you're seeing, if you like this video, please like it. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell and all that good stuff. This show is live twice a week. We are live at 1 p.m. Eastern time every Tuesday and we are live in the uh, evening on Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern time. That's when Greg Merson will be joining me to watch the 2012 main event final table. So that's going to be an incredible one as well. So if you like this video and do all that good stuff for me, I will promise you that I'll deliver the best guests on this show for many, many weeks to come. Because obviously, main event finalists and main event winners is, is the coolest thing. And you know, someone like Dan has won a similar event like the one drop. But once I've got all those guys out of the way, we're going to get funky. We're going to do some Poker After Dark Season 1 stuff. Who knows? Maybe I can get Sean Chacon on the show. How funny would that be? Or I'll try to watch some old school WSP uh, prelim events. You know, some of the, you know, maybe some uh, seven card stud with uh, Marcel Lusk. Who knows? I'll try to do my best to get whoever you guys want to see on this very show. And what I want you guys to do, if you're watching this in the comments, so not in the chat, but in the comments, I don't know how exactly how that works because we're live right now, but let me know in the comments who you guys want to see and whatever gets the most likes in the comments, I'll make sure to get those people on the show. And I think, you know, Peter Eastgate said no and Phil Ivey probably won't say yes. Maybe, maybe I can't get P.S. Hines, but most of the players, I'm pretty confident that I can get on this show. So I'll do my best to get as many big names on the show as possible. And you guys can also make suggestions for big final tables as Dan is taking a short break right now. But we are watching the 2014 big one for one drop final table. By the way, Tony Burns, thanks for watching on Facebook. I see you out there. Um, Dan, Tony. Tony Burns is in there. He's giving us a shout out. Yeah, I love Tony, obviously. Um, yeah, Jamie Gold is coming on the show. Jamie and I are, are trying to figure it out, and we're going to go and make that happen in the future as well. So we got Greg Mercer coming up, Ryan Reese is coming up, lots of big names. But right now, Dan Coleman heads up against Daniel Legrano. Lots of big action. You said you were you were just like ready to fire. You knew all the bet sizes. So you know we're just rolling into this heads up play. And uh, if you see something you like, or if you remember a moment, then uh, you know chime in on 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 what went down. There's a small blind. Also the button X first pre flop and the second post flop. Queen nine of clubs for Negrano, and he will call for a million eight more. Negrano, the blind, most of the summer start. playing mixed game. I want to say, this World Series, so he's a little rusty, I mean, no limit hold I'm tough to like say. I was going to say 601.2 million, but because I think Vogelsang busted during the 501 million level. Mm. Yeah. yeah so I'm going to just say it. I suck at heads up poker. And I think I speak for 99% of the people. So enlighten us with, with even even with the knowledge you have left after leaving the I game. I definitely behind. suck too right now. Yeah. Uh, what enlighten is, us with what? What is heads up poker about? How did you get good at it? And, and what are things that people can do in order to get better? Because what you knew back then and what you still remember now is still better than what most of us do. Yeah. Man, tough. I just played people better than me, and I just played so like I was so I have a exceptional memory, um, and then to go along with I was able to. I was just happy to make mistakes, you know, play somebody better than me and try out new things and see what worked, and also I could like I did a really good job of I gained probably like the most help to my poker career was playing people like Ike and Ben 86 and heads up sitting goes where they, they were better than me for sure. But like I was learning so much, like they were taking what they were like figuring out in cash games and playing me. And I was seeing how they were playing hands. Like I, I was able to like, I think like reverse engineer and really like meditate on like why they were doing certain things. Then impl I didn't love all of it, but a lot of it I really liked. And then I implemented that into my game. I'd also like play cash games every now and then versus really good players. And they were doing stuff completely different than what heads up sitting goes heads up sitting players were doing. And I took what I liked that I thought would work in heads up sitting goes like put it into uh, practice. Um, so yeah, I mean, my whole game was just trial and error and taking shots against good players and using it as like a learning experience, you know? Um, so I, I'm not sure like how to get good. And that's probably not applicable today. Right. I think today you just want to study solvers and like, their solutions right so as far as your memory does that mean you remember like you know hands or tendencies or or a different approaches yeah, like yeah just like any hand that happened like that any like notable hand versus people like i would just 
have it in my memory. And, and I'd also like, and if I made mistakes or like somebody like call my bluff in a spot where like, how'd they call me there? Like, uh, I'm like, a, I'm obsessive about stuff. So I remember like, I, I couldn't think until the next time I played the person, like a day later or two days later, I would just always be thinking that, about that spot, you know, like, wow, like what do I need to do about my range if they were able to call me there? And then I just think like, then I have to be like thinking like, what adjustments am I going to make next time? And I think this through and then I'm happy to play them again next time. This is like, if I'm battling somebody heads up and then, Ooh, this is a good hand. So Daniel makes, uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to uh, just make adjustments. And if it didn't work that time, try something else out and yeah, just brute force my way into like getting good. And then the ground bets 3 million on the flopper you call with the, uh, with the Jack here. What's your thought? What are you thinking when you see this? Yeah, when he checks back the turn, I think for sure now I have the best hand. Like, why wouldn't he continue with anything? And now I have queen jack. I don't think he, unless he has queen king, I think I'm for sure ahead here. Um, I figure he'd still be barreling a 10 8. Uh, king 10, maybe he checks. So you're betting 7 million into, into um, 11 million? Mm -hmm. what, what range do, do you think you're getting uh, called by here? Uh, I, I mean, I think that he's probably is, he would be betting jacks on that flop. Um, I think maybe he has a nine. I know he's very stationy. Um, maybe he has like, yeah, I don't know. I, I just thought like, yeah, maybe he has a jack and I know he's stationy too. And might think like, oh, maybe I can get a read that he has a, a missed flush draw if then call with a nine. I don't know. So in, in this spot right here, he's probably too tight to ever bluff raise there. Yeah, yeah, I think so on this stage too. And I call out his hand too. I negrounded him. <laughs> Should never fold here. And I'm just saying this stuff to try and like get a reaction what out of him. Olivier do? Right. I think he'd shave and then fold. <laughs> All right. Guess you have King 10. <laughs> oh, look at that. Look at that. But if it was a real Daniel Negreanu move, you would have called his hand, and then you would have made the wrong decision by calling. <laughs> he always joked about that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He calls it, then throws in the chips, anyways. Right. But the, Dan, so Daniel explained to me on on the same show when we were watching some old footage. He was saying that he used to always do that, call out people's hands, because he would get such a visible reaction from people when they when he called out their exact hand. So on they'd be spooked by him later on in the tournament and just full sail his way. Right. And also he yeah. said that like, you know, the moments that made it on TV were the ones where he looked silly. But he would do it off TV as well and and get so many hero folds out of that because people would literally like freeze up when you like call their exact two cards every time. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it served a purpose for him. Yeah, it makes sense. It's almost like um, you know, being uh, one of those uh, psychics where like they're like they're like guessing and then they they just trying to look for a reaction. Right, right. Yep. That makes sense. All right, two and a half million is a raise. About 18 million, but the pots are so huge at this stage. 25 to 35 million. Neither satisfied until they have all the chips. The so Daniel, three good. betting here with King Seven off. Um, would you like to call there with the King Seven? Is that a normal play? I mean, I'm not sure what's correct today. Very well, very well, it could be that this is a three bet. But I think back then, in my mind, I was thinking like, what the hell are you doing, three betting that hand? That's trash. Just call. Right. But how does how does it how does it adjust your thinking on Daniel's range? Because you're obviously calling in position here with Ace Jack. Uh, because you you like Daniel is not known to be hyper aggressive. You were mentioning earlier, you know, it's a big spot for him. He's not going to probably do anything crazy. So when he three right. bets, when he three bets so there, my take was like if he was doing stuff like this, like just the way like I've constructed my ranges, like I am going to have such a good chance to just like he's just going to get crushed, but. There's for sure a chance where he does some like nutty stuff like this and it works out. And I'm still just gonna like call down and like maybe I bust, maybe I just lose because he just these views worked out for him, you know. But I was willing to just like call down and play my normal game. Like I wasn't gonna do anything to like seize up by seize up in the moment and like try and fold just to continue the match because I think like, I have edges later on. Like I was just gonna play my game and like if yeah, if he put me in a tough spot, like look, this is how I normally play in heads up singles and I'm not going to fold this part of my range, I call it, you know? Right. So then as far as on the turn, if he barrels again, is that an easy fold? I'm probably still calling. Uh, what is he, uh, did he bet the turn too? Or no, he just bet the flop and shut down? Yeah, shut down, check, check. Yeah, yeah I'm probably still calling. So then what do you, 
like what gets you to full three three full barrels is that the only thing even then maybe not i don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's incredible i mean th for someone like myself on my level that is so hard to understand but i of course am much too worried about you know the money and like I, mean, all I, played, I was playing so many heads up and goes then i just like ace jack in that spot i'm just not folding you know i'm definitely not following the flop or the turn right on the river i'm gonna decide and maybe it's in probably a good good amount of time then it's like i still call right um what, what what was your relationship with daniel you know before during after like do you guys talk like have you guys ever spoken about this this moment no no i mean i've seen him play like, we played some super high rollers after and we were cordial but yeah yeah, I mean, I think I think he's a nice guy. Yeah, no, for sure. I was just wondering, there might be you know a, a funny story there. Um, as far no, as either. as far as the win though, because this was a, a huge moment, big payout for yourself, but also for all the investors. Um, was there a big party that night? The night after, was there a celebration? Like, what what was what was happening? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, we partied that night, and then like I had some friends flying in town. They were coming in town anyways. Then partied the rest of the weeks. So, yeah. It was a good week. What what did a Dan Coleman poker player party look like back in those days? Uh, back then, I was just going to clubs in Vegas. So just, I think, spent the week at clubs every night. Was it uh, was it bottle service and just uh, inviting all the friends and going nuts? Yeah, probably something like did that. Did you have your name on a sign? Was that a, was that a thing? No, I hate that shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, the, the first night, they like brought out a sign saying like one drop. And I was like, no, 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 please like get that out of here. <laughs> <laughs> too, uh, much, too much attention, uh, for yeah. sure. All right, next hand here. Daniel raising with the jack eight. Um, Coleman again, the grunter with a raise to two and a half million. Coleman with nine trades. Maybe Coleman will become the Howard Hughes of poker. Billionaire, reclusive, living in a hotel room. Hughes probably sat on his butt watching Jeopardy all day. Coleman will be playing Sid and goes online. <laughs> Coleman. All right, so explain the uh, explain this. Yeah, so I'd pick hands like this to three bet then. Uh, hands with, like low equity, just try and like win the win the pot here. We get like one C bet in and like boards that favor my range. Get in the fold, I don't know. I think I think that's what I was thinking at the time. Pretty loose with the nine. With it's the honestly, it's like something that I was doing in heads up soon goes and it was working, you know? Right. <laughs> like that's pretty thought process. Nine tray against Jack eight. <laughs> I love these classic heads up battles. All right, here's the flop. Eight deuce tray, middle pair for Coleman, top pair for Negreanu. Check. Check from Coleman. Yeah, top I pair probably like your small pair. bet there. Over checking, but hey. He was partially staked by Todd Brunson. Brunson's girlfriend at the time was Jen Harmon, who Daniel met and then became close friends with. And of course, tonight oh. she's on the rail for him. Jen Harmon sitting just behind Daniel. What are the chip stacks here? Big bet. Oh, it's tough to see. 100 million each. That was a really funny move you made with your chips. You were counting out a stack and then you pushed two other stacks forward to make the call. As if you were you were counting how much you had left instead of how much it was to call. Hmm. Granu shoves for over thirty million. I didn't expect that. Pot size shove. Yeah, you're not alone. And Coleman lets his hand go. Negreanu will stack the winnings, and the crowd here at the Rio predominantly in Kid Poker's corner. Look who's on top again. Sixty-six million. So there was basically hundred and thirty million in chips in play. Right, 40, 42 players. Yeah. Yeah, so now it's about even, right? He has 66 yeah. million, I got like 56, yeah. Yeah, so now it's about even. Yeah, I know that one. Daniel Negreanu back in the lead here at the big one for one drop. More after this. So as far as you know, changing gears, um, is it like playing from whatever, nine down to three is, is one game and the heads up is its own thing? Or yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that is really the case for you? Yeah, for sure. And I there's like ICM considerations that take place in like you're, you're gaming the payout ladder, you know, like you're like not playing all the hands you would be otherwise if it wasn't payouts. It's like you are sitting back, letting other stacks go at it to knock each other out. Um, but then heads up, it's just like pure poker, you know, there's no more laddering. And right. Play your game. Was there ever was, was there ever talk of a deal? No. 
And and was that from your perspective? Just you know, I'm- actually, it's funny. You know, so Harlow Bob, he had a he's probably like the biggest individual investor in me, and he goes up to Negrano at the start of the heads up, and he goes something about like Negrano thought he's gonna be asking like about a deal. And Bob goes, why don't we play the, for the whole thing? Like, no, uh, winner take all. And then the guy was just like, what? No, get out of here. <laughs> it, was a, it was a pretty boss move. Oh, my God. Yeah, that, that's the ultimate all in from the rail. That's the easiest move to make. Yep. Hey, if you're Bob, you can do it. Yeah, exactly. For him, for him, it's probably doable. <laughs> that's pretty incredible. Now six of spades. Check. If they're going to check it down, they might as well just open up a dishwasher school together. <laughs> Runner reaching for chips now, though. That's 3.5. Three and a half million after Coleman had checked. Three and a half million on that board. Check, oh, check. Is that a river bet? By Sorry? Nicola? I'm just saying fold it, kid. <laughs> I mean, it's locked in figures. Negrano's betting because his hand is so bad, it can't win a showdown. Coleman looks into Negrano's eyes. In the library. And calls. King. A pair of kings is good. <laughs> So uh, the, the, the swings from how you remember in this battle, they seem to be pretty large going back and forth. Uh, I really don't have much of a recollection. I, I think it stayed about even for a while. So, okay, 74 million. I got 50. I got, yeah, 50 million. Yeah, 51.8, yeah. So w was did you feel any, I don't know, I, I, pressure is probably the wrong word because, you know, you mentioned that. Oh, I didn't feel pressure. No. So... You were, were you just having fun? Like, what was the feeling? Like, were you... It wasn't having fun. It was just this thing of, like, being in the zone, you know? Like, it, I was just present and just executing my game. Yeah. So, yeah, would, there's, would, would there's you say no it was almost like a ro robotic sort of approach where, like, you were, yeah. like, zoned in like that? Totally. That's so insane. That's so crazy to think about. Yeah, especially, too, on, like, that biggest stage for, like, the most money I've ever played for in my life. But, yeah, I was just totally in the moment. Right. And then, you know, ima like imagine from the Grano's perspective, he's heads up with, with all his, what he's already won and, you know, his name, reputation, playing heads up against a kid who is basically doing this for a living, playing heads up. Yeah, like this young 23-year-old is kind of like unknown on this stage and like, I don't know, I feel like I, I seem like I'm pretty confident, like not really phased by the moment, you know, apart from that one deep breath I just took. <laughs> <laughs> With ace queen with his clothes on ace is raised to two and a half million coleman with an ace ace eight and there's a call defending the ace eight offsuit here against ace queen Jack nine, Jack two hearts, both miss. Is this one of those situations where you were mentioning earlier with like, you know, the as far as game plan and range, having ace high and calling from the big blind means you're in for a couple streets? Yeah, exactly. He is dominated here, Negrano with that ace queen. And there's a call from Daniel Coleman. So that you make, you make heads up poker sound much more... I mean, solve is the wrong word, but you make it sound much more like... Yeah, dude, honestly, back then, like, I had, like, everything... I, I had my play style down where, yeah, I I had my hands where I'd, like, be in for, like, a, a flop bet, a turn bet. I had my hands where I would always... Ch I'd always check the flop with middle with middle pair and then call two streets with it. I'd just bluff catch with it. Uh, and then I, like, low pair, I would just bet for protection. Like, it was a really, like, simplified strategy. But at the time, like, I was playing, like sometimes I'd play eight tables at once against like total fish, you know, like uh, not total fish, uh, like probably like five different players at once. So I had to have like a simplified strategy that I could just like mass produce, you know? Um, and it was, it worked out for like first, almost all players, you know, uh, I really worked on it to get this one strategy down that I could just play like 10 hours a day with versus <laughs> all opponents. That's nuts. Um, earlier you said, I mean, you catch an eight on the river here to win this hand. Earlier you said uh, playing 10 million hands. Like, do you, what do you think? How many hands have you played? And like at the peak of your power, how many hours a day were you playing? I'm not sure if it was that many hands, but I was playing in, two, in 2013, man. I was a fucking machine. I was playing 12 to 14 hours a day. And I'd take maybe one day off a month. Wow. Um, dude, it was insane. Um, I don't know what got into me that year. I mean, I, I t I'd taken like a year off poker at that point going into 2013. And I was just so ready to just give it my all. 
and it's really like all I wanted to do. And I, I cleared out lobbies, like heads up singles was king of the hill, you know. Once you beat all the players, you, you go to war, you battle everyone. And when you're the victor, like you have all the lobbies to yourself. Now I no longer have to play good players because they're afraid of me. I get only fish. And I was, it was really sick. I was making like five to eight thousand dollars in EV a day. And I was never, I'd have made one losing day a week. Um, so I was like, how could I not play poker right now? Like I, I'd never had success in poker because I was always gambling too much, like playing people better than me. And now I'm finding like I've carved out this like little niche area for myself and all the fish want to play this one game. And how can I not play every day, every waking second, you know? Wow. What were the stakes back then as far as the action you could get? So I was just playing $500, $500 and 1K heads up hypers, you know? Right. And yeah, the swings were like throughout that year, like I probably made like more EV than like the nosebleed like PLO players. And my biggest downswing was like 30 or 50,000 that year. Wow. Like, yeah, it was sick. So the skill gap was just insane versus fish. Insane. Uh, I was making 5% ROI in like a, a game that on average would take three minutes to play. Wow, that's ridiculous. It so how many game, how many sites were you playing at the same time? We're watching an interesting hand here, by the way. We'll, we'll get caught up. And poker stars. Oh, just two sites. Wow. So we got 7 million bet here. So you bet uh, 7 into 10 when you hit the ace on the turn uh, against the ground is King Queen, who has a flush draw. Negrano has 70 million here, and you have 55 million. So he has you covered by a bit. And like I said, this is my strategy where I'm not sure if it's good today, but I'd always bet this the low pair. So I have a four, so I make a small C bet, and then look to like check back the most turns. Then I hit my ace, so I bet. Coleman seemed to think, why are you calling? I'm the one with aces up. Another wow, here we go. River. Coleman Rivers, a full house. Negrano missed everything. Coleman's got everything, and he's going to try to get value here. But there's this not draws a my three quarter pot bet. The bets nowadays are either very small or very big, and back then there was like some kind of middle ground still. Yeah, but, but even then, like I was betting bigger than most people. I'd have like three quarter pots, and I, most people just always do like half pot bets or a little smaller. Right. It's just eighteen million, probably. Yeah. I guess Kit Poker's taking one last sip of water before he folds. Now I'm thinking to myself, I know you're a hero caller. I know you're a fucking hero caller. Come on. Come on. I mean, what's the... I didn't think he'd hero call with a hand like this. <laughs> right. Wow. You know, Daniel does it in Hollywood. I guess he's wondering if King Hyde... Oh, you'll see something hit. interesting in this hand where I almost like smile because he's talking to me the whole time. And then he even starts talking to his reel. And at this point, the way he was talking... I knew he didn't even give a fuck about me anymore. All he cared about was like convincing himself to call. Right. I was like, it's happening 100% now. He'll take a big hit. Negrano just with king high. Remember, Coleman called Negrano earlier just with queen high. So perhaps a suspiciously large river bet from Coleman has Negrano thinking about this. <laughs> He's too happy about trying to make a call. Right. <laughs> He's thinking of the glory of this absurd hero call going right. I don't think you have good cards. <laughs> but I could be wrong. He's so happy. <laughs> I'm getting a smile. Full house. Whoa. That's good. Yeah, nice. <laughs> what a play from Coleman at a critical juncture and got Negrano to make the call. Wow. Yeah, buddy. Huge, huge swing. Dude. In the, in the heads up play, he had the chip lead leading into this hand, and now you have the chip lead in your hands, um, which is kind of helpful uh, if you're playing heads up poker. It makes a big difference. Well, he lost almost half his, ch half his chips here, so basically you almost got uh, yourself a double up, or you add a 50%. Welcome back to the Rio, the second biggest poker tournament in history is heads up. 23-year-old Daniel Coleman. Is that, did you get a watch for winning? Yeah, I did. And they and they fucking engraved my name wrong. Everybody does this with my name. C-O-L, they put an E in there. And what? <laughs> so I had a watch that says C-O-L-E-M-A-N on it. No way. Yeah. I tried to get them to fix it. And they're just like, oh, we can't really do that. That's nuts. 
Wow. All right, we got the A6 raise here. Jack 10 suited. I just came up with 5.6 because you did it. I don't know if it's the right number. Oh, that's the right number. It's yeah. Number. <laughs> you just call it anyway. <laughs> that's, actually, that's actually pretty good. All right. He started copying your race sizes. Three good cards, him yeah. nothing. Legrano will be out of position after the flop. The flop is six, jack, nine. Bottom pair for Negrano. Top pair for Coleman. Negrano checks. Coleman. What happened here? I limp called. Four million and makes it four million. Let me see. I think so. Did you limp call? I, I limped, then he re-raised me, yeah. Because I, I had like, I think no, 15. No, you're, you're on, oh yeah, 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 that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I have 20 big blinds, so I don't want to min-raise and have to fold to a jam with Jack-10, you know? So I'd rather limp than just call a big, like, raise. It sucks if he goes all in, but it's like Jack-10 plays so well, you know? And I don't know why he's raising A6, you know? That plays kind of shit post-flop. When I do call, he's just be going all in or, like, checking back. Or... Right. He's adept at playing long sessions. I tell you, this guy knows nothing. He's good on his own, Daniel Coleman. Negrano check. And now no, it goes. That's eight million. That's not a good card. Not a fold. Not a good card. He seems a bit more defeated too compared to his yeah. earlier posture. Hundred percent. Probably down on himself for making that call, you know. Yeah, the emotional swings of poker are, you know, they never get any easier. Um, if, really if, if you got if you got like down on chips in like a heads up battle in, in a moment like this. Would you feel it too? Because you said you're a tilter, so would you feel that? Uh, I don't think I would in, on, in a heads-up match because I was just – I was honestly a machine when it came to heads-up singles then, so I just had my strategy. Right. Um, if it was – I'd be able to be composed in a situation like this, but if we were playing like a, a online for like smaller stakes or something, like I could definitely tilt. Right. Over a hundred million chips. It's actually interesting. I'm probably the, the most I tilted was when somebody was tilting versus me and just playing so bad, and I was battling them. I would just unravel. I'd get so I just want to tilt back and like show them like, look, like I'll play crazy too. Then I'd end up losing. This happens so often. Like winning tilt. I can't, I can't raise that big than pull. No, I know. I just... so I takes a oh, okay. He limp jammed. Yeah, he limp jammed. Yeah. So what do you think when you see this? Do you remember the moment? Yeah, I'm thinking 40% chance I'm the one drop winner. And even if he doubles up, he still has 40 million. I can get him right back down. A Broadway draw to add some drama for Coleman. Always got to be out, no matter what. This is cool to watch again. It's been a while. <laughs> I think a four is coming. <laughs> Turn, baby. Let's go ten. Turn card now. Oh, the ten giving Coleman a straight. Four. <laughs> Negrano felt that blow, but picks himself back up. Positive vibes. Negrano needs it here. Negrano needs a four or an ace, or Daniel Coleman is the one drop champion. The river card is a seven. Good game, man. You're tough. I love the Just way you play. Daniel oh. Coleman prevails and wins $15.3 million. There it is, the 10 of the turn, Broadway straight, no four on the river for Daniel, and you win the tournament. Um, seeing this again now, you know, like, uh, what, what stands out? You know, the, the, the cheering section or just the moment itself? Like, how, how does it feel? You're like, I don't know. I mean, it's tough to say. Uh, it's cool watching it again. Uh, we live in the moments. Uh, it's weird too, because I mean, when I was playing it, like I was, I was just so in the zone, like I wasn't thinking about it. You know, I wasn't even like even feeling much, like just so focused on the play. Right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's cool. I can watch it back and actually enjoy it. Yeah, man, it's awesome. It's been it's been a pleasure reliving all these moments with you. It's been awesome to have you on the show. And for the people that are watching, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel. 
I got Greg Merson coming on a Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time, to watch the 2012 main event final table, which was a great final table. Very interesting to watch. Um, Dan Coleman, we, I guess we can see you in the mountains. Like, how can we ever run into you again? Are you just, you know, living somewhere in, in a cabin or? I'll probably play the main event every year, probably. You know? Oh, good. Too bad they're not having it this year, but yeah, I, it's tough to pass up the main event, right? So how has your how has your value in the main event decreased? Like, let's say you were, you know, worth three three x markup back in the day, and now we're down to what two, and it's gonna. Keep you know, going. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know if it has because the main event is such a unique tournament where it's just it, it's the most important thing is not being a good player; it's being seen as a good player because it's like eighty percent amateurs. You know, right? They just give me too much respect. I can say over the way of the people I know are better than me. Uh, even like Phil Helmuth, who obviously like he's not that great at poker. I think in the main event, like he's one of the best players because every amateur is afraid of him. Right. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I like my chances still in the main event, so I'll keep playing that every year probably. Maybe you should wear the uh, incorrect spelling Dan Coleman uh, watch so to make sure people rem- <laughs> remember who who won who won the one drop. That's right. Let them know. All Which right. Was- uh, Dan, thank you so much once again for being on the show. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have much more footage to have you back on the show because you know this is the big one you won that we have the rights to. Uh, but if anything ever comes up, I would love to have you back on the show. Um, for the people that are watching, thanks so much once again t- for being with us. Really appreciate it. I'll be back on Thursday with Greg Merson. For now, for Dan Coleman and myself, this was Running Back, and we'll catch you guys the next week.